All right, so welcome back to a, another episode of Thinking Critically. Today, I am joined by Dr. Sean Carbonell, who uh, originally got his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Washington and then went on to get his MD, PhD. So he is a double doctorate or a dual doctoral degree uh, in holding individual from the University of uh, Virginia School of Medicine. So during his res residency, he actually ended up dropping out, and he um, is now the co-founder and president of the nonprofit Cure Glioblastoma, as well as an inventor of a glioblastoma drug uh, candidate that's currently in phase one clinical trials. And last but not least, he is also co-founder of a clinical stage biotech uh, company called Onco Synergy. Anyway, Sean, thank you so much for joining. That's quite that's quite the list of accomplishments that you have for yourself. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. This is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you here. And so anyway, I was just curious as to, so let's, let's kind of go to the beginning. Like how exactly did you even get interested in, let's say science to begin with? So I noticed you went from like psychology into medicine, but like, how did you even find yourself in psychology to begin with or interested in science to begin with? Sure. I mean, that, that was actually later in the game. Uh, you know, I was pre-med from the start in college. Um, originally, I was uh, a microbiology major uh, because, and this was in the 90s, I'm, I'm in my 40s now. Um, and so in the 90s, the, the book, The Hot Zone came out, which is about, you know, one of the Ebola outbreaks in, in Virginia. Um, and I was just really hot on Ebola. And so I decided to declare in microbiology, started doing the coursework, realized I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. Um, I wanted to work in the level four, but <laughs> obviously, when you're a a sophomore, you can't do that. But uh, then, then I went to these pre-med meetings. They're saying, you know, you know, you get, you get, you're going to do so much prereqs that you should study what you enjoy and that what you're interested in. And so, for me, it always had been the brain. Um, and psychology was pretty awesome. I enjoyed the one-on-one -on -one course. And 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 ironically, I went to University of Washington, as you mentioned. Ironically, although they had a a uh, you know, top 10 graduate level neuroscience program, there was no undergrad neuroscience program at the time. Um, and they didn't put that in until the year after I graduated. So my only option was psychology, you know, maybe zoology as well. But, uh, so, but I'm glad I, I took that route because I got a lot of the behavior and, and sort of the higher functioning uh, neuroscience that I might've missed if I just focused on hardcore, you know, cell and molecular neuroscience. Um, but so, so that's, that's how I ended up in psychology. But even before then, just a quick story of how I grew up, like my earliest memories, uh, I remember in first grade, Mrs. Hoagie's class, <laughs> it was, it was the coolest, it was, a, it was, a, it was an experiment. And I don't know where she got the idea from. I don't think it was curriculum in, in the district, but it was a really cool ecology experiment. So the first thing is we had these little terrariums, we had some soil. Learn. I don't know, I guess we learned about soil, but then, um, then she gave us um, some grass seeds, put in the grass seeds, uh, you know, a week later, we start to see the grass grow. And then after that, um, she gave us a bunch of crickets. Um, and then we put the crickets in the terrarium, crickets start eating the grass. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, she gave us a knolls, you know, those American chameleon lizards from, uh, from the South. And we put those in and they ate the crickets. Um, and it was a really cool, you know, in real life uh, type of experiment that you can see with, with you, you know, you build it with your own hand, you watch it happen and before your own eyes. Um, and so that was, that, that's like my earliest memory of just being captivated by the whole ecology of everything, the plants, the animals. And uh, from that moment, uh, I literally would drag my dad to the library every weekend. Um, and this is again in the the eighties. So, you know, there was no internet, there's only libraries. So literally, I'd have them, I do the research in, in like the yellow pages or something, and I'd have them take me to different libraries in the district, and I would just devour all the, um, the bug books and, and the biology books and things like that. And, I, that's, and so, yeah, that's how it started, really, first grade. So you were, uh, you were super into, I believe it's uh, entomology then, so the study yeah, of insects exactly. and whatnot, yeah, when you were Yes, in herpetology, young. I was fascinated by lizards and snakes. Almost. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's sure. that's super fascinating. Yeah, I think that I think that at some point, well, I mean, I, I was a kid in the 90s, not in the 80s, but uh, I mean, a good chunk of my childhood, I didn't have the internet that we do today. So I also spent a lot of time in the library. 
and I was fascinated by dinosaurs for a while, but other sorts of various various scientific aspects as well. I think I think most kids have like a dinosaur phase. Oh, for <laughs> I don't sure. know if you had I don't for know sure. if you had a dinosaur dinosaur phase, but I, I did. I, I did. did. There's a yeah. book. There's a book that uh, there's a dinosaur book that I made my mom read very often, even when I was like too big to be read to. But <laughs> um, <laughs> I was just yeah. I mean, I literally had these three dinosaur books, and I just look at them like almost every day. It was. That's all I had. <laughs> yeah. Didn't have the internet. So. Yeah, that's so that's, so that's super fascinating. So it started in first grade for you, and that's really kind of what piqued your interest. And then from there, you've kind of you learned all about science because, well, I'm assuming that you know as you devoured more and more books, you became even more interested. And then you know eventually, as you got yeah. older, you learned about what it means to like be a scientist and what exactly, uh, mm-hmm. what what it is that you do and things like that. So anyway, yeah, that's so that's super super fascinating, and. Okay, so that's where it started for you. And then, you know, did you know, like, was it like at that point, you're like, hey, you know, I want to do this? Like, when did that really click? So you got interested in first grade. And then I'm assuming as time went on, you can you continue to devour more and more information within the sciences. But when did you decide, like, as you were getting towards, let's say, college, college age, so like high school, late high school, that like, hey, like, I want to go on, and I want to you know, do something in the sciences, in particular, like in biology, sure. perhaps, but you ended up having to, you ended up going into psychology. I'm just curious as to how that all played out for you. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, even, even before then, again, like in, like in fifth grade, we had to draw what we thought we were going to be or what we wanted to be. And I, I drew myself as a scientist and I, I don't really know, you know, just like this, the stereotypical scientist with a lab coat glasses and holding a yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um So, but I, I didn't, I don't, I don't really think I understood what that meant. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, so I was always just fascinated by biology in general. Um, and I think when I got to college, a lot of it was, to be honest, uh, parental pressure, you know, being from an Asian <laughs> family, <laughs> uh, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's some pressure, um, to go into something that has sort of like a safety, uh, a financial safety aspect to it. And then like and a lawyer people, or a doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lawyer, doctor, engineer, maybe, yeah. um, yeah, something that they can hold that they can uh, brag to their friends about. But uh, uh, so it's pervasive Fun. in the culture. So like almost <laughs> most of my friends who are also, I'm Filipino, um, who are Asian or Filipino, most of them went in pre-med. And then of course, you know, out of my friend group, I was the only one that actually um, finished. Um, um, so, uh, but that's, that's literally how it started. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I started college. I knew I was interested in biology. Um, so, you know, just from parental pressure, I started on the pre-med track wasn't really into it because, um, again, I was sort of doing it because it wasn't my true interest. I was, I was just sort of following my parents' advice. Um, and they were in college, which I'm grateful for. And back, but back then it was dirt cheap. I mean, yeah. um, four figures. So, uh, but, uh, so, so I just going through the motions. I was a really half-hearted pre-med. I first term, I really didn't do as well. You know, I used to never really had to study because I would just be interested in class. I'd listen and I learned really well that way. And um, so I just never really needed to study, but in college, obviously, it's another level all human. So um, it's uh, it, it, I, that that method did not fare so well. So I had no good study skills on top to boot. But so what really changed for me is I started going to these pre med meetings because I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need to um, you know try and actually do it and give it a shot, a real shot. And so I started going to these pre med meetings, and it was it was great. And I you know I met you know so. It, it not only brought me more knowledge of the, of the field, um, I started seeing the pre-made counters, but also brought me a lot of community. And I ended up being an, an officer in that society, um, the historian, um, and that was really cool. And so that just uh, made me really excited about it. And so I started volunteering in the hospital. And that's really where um, things really took off. And I, you know, just went, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. This is awesome. So um, volunteer experience at the University of Washington Hospital. And then I got so into it that I want to do more. And, and the TV show ER just came out. So I volunteered in the okay. uh, trauma center at Harborview, which is a level one trauma center, um, you know, in the middle of the city. And I got, you know, the, the holy grail of shifts. I got the 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift on Saturday. Um, and so, you know, my first shift, it was, it was, am- it, it changed, it, it changed my whole perspective. I mean, um, yeah, I saw multiple car accidents, uh, you know, motorcycle accidents. I got to see procedures that they don't do anymore, like a DPL, a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. It's, it's like obsolete now. Um, and, you know, seeing residents fight and stuff like that, just like you see on TV. 
Um, and I brought the body of a 14 year old boy to the morgue. I mean, these, this is on the first night, but after, but that at the, at oh 2 AM, I was like, I was like, Oh my God, this is, this is, this is what I that had to do. be. That had to be overwhelming. I mean, particularly, oh, absolutely. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't, I, I can't even imagine on my first night on the job having to, you know, wheel away the corpse of a child like that that's pretty intense. yeah no it was it was i mean so you know obviously the body was already covered and it was yeah. coming from the, the floor so i didn't actually see the body and i didn't necessarily want to um but yeah that was, i mean that was that was tough uh, and there are a lot of tough situations like that you know and dealing with families and loss like in the moment and just um and, and almost and so i i knew um that I had compassion, but sometimes I think like my compassion gets too overwhelming because <laughs> yeah. I remember one time uh, a family just lost someone in a car accident and they were wailing in the hall. And I, and I just, I just, it's still now like it chokes me up. Like I was non-functional for an hour. Like I couldn't, like, I was like crying. <laughs> I, I didn't yeah. even see them. I just heard it. And, and that, and that, um, that really affected me. So, and so, but it also, you know, it was like, okay, I want to help save lives, blah, blah, blah. And that sort of fed into the whole thing. Um, but yeah, so it was a really change, changed my whole perspective. I was no longer a half hearted pre med. I went at, went at it hard. My um, grades turned around, started getting 4.0s, um, really nailed the MCAT the second time. It took me two, two tries. So that was it. That was the, that was a pivotal moment. You're like, you know, I've got to go into med mm-hmm. when you, when you were working that shift. That's super interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. I got to, uh, yeah. I've got to accept the fact that I, that I, that I do want to do this. Um, yeah. Even at, when I previously didn't really want to. Okay. That's fascinating. And then like, so, okay. So you're like, I want to do med. Then at one point, at what point were you like, okay, MD, PhD, like I want to be a medical mm-hmm. scientist because of course to do med, you don't have to do the dual degree. Uh, you can just do the MD route and, you know, you can even become, so you ended up going into neurosurgery. I know that you can even, you know, you don't have to have the PhD in addition to the MD to be a neurosurgeon. So I'm just curious. As to why, uh, yeah. Why did you decide to add the, to go for the dual degree and get that PhD? Like I'm, sure. I'm assuming that there's some aspect of research that you really enjoyed. Yeah. So I, I, uh, along with the whole ER experience, you know, the next, the next level was actually, you know, every, everyone says, you know, it's, it's helpful to have research experience as a pre-med. Um, and so that was my next, um, Opus, I guess, uh, during my pre-med career, uh, the first lab uh, was okay. You know, it um, it was in psychology. It was required to do a psychology rotation for two um, terms, uh, but the the lab I chose wasn't great from a mentorship standpoint because I literally didn't even meet the PI in the entire two terms. <laughs> I'd walk by the office and he wouldn't know who the heck I was. Um, so I was working with one of the postdocs, but it was a it was a uh, Diabetes, a neurobiology of, of diabetes lab. So they did a lot of brain surgery, actually, and I knew I was interested in brain surgery. Um, and so that lab allowed me to learn how to, you know, learn all the surgical techniques in, in rats. Um, and so, so that I took away that from, from that experience, left as soon as I could after the two terms. And I found a neurosurgeon, uh, Sean Grady, um, at University of Washington. He had a lab. Um, and he and I basically again at that time there's no internet right so I I had to look up I had to look at the catalog and say see who all the neurosurgeons are and I literally an email was pretty new too I think that was you know when I just started um, college and so I just emailed literally a bunch of um, neurosurgeons whose research interested me and he was the only one that reached out um, which is lucky because he turned out to be fantastic awesome mentor um, you know took me under his wing he gave me a shot after two months of really kicking ass in the lab and just really loving it, just like I, the experience I had in the ER, um, you know, I, I got kind of bold and um, I asked him for my own project, um, fully expecting him to say no. And he's, and he was like, oh, it was, and I proposed a project to him. He was like, no, I totally want to give you a project, but let's talk about this, this one, maybe something else. And so, yeah, so we were able to come up with a project that we, that was good for both of us. Um, and that literally turned into my uh, first paper, um, you know, I think within the year, um, which is a really awesome experience. So he really went um, hard on um, on being uh, basically again um, sort of the wind beneath my wings. He he really he really supported me um, financially and um, scientifically. 
um, which is awesome for a neurosurgeon. And then he also got me into the department. So every Wednesday, there is a Grand Rounds at 7 a.m. And so I'd take the bus to Harborview and, and go to Grand Rounds every Wednesday. Um, soon, all the residents uh, started noticing me and the chairman. And, and so um, Dr. Grady introduced me to all of them. And so, um, you know, and I'm friends with, with many of them still. Um, and Dr. Grady continues to be a mentor and, and a friend. He, he was actually on, most recently on my scientific advisory board of my first startup. So 20 years later, um, he's still having a massive impact on my, on my life and my career. Um, so that experience was amazing. So we published three first author papers together. Um, and so to get, to get back to the question, why MD-PhD, um, when I was thinking about that question for real, because um, I, I had learned about that through the pre-med society, through the meetings. And um, so I asked him about it, I asked the chairman about it, and they both said that they, they didn't do it, but they wish they had, um, because uh, they think the preparation for the PhD would have helped them um, with, you know, just competition for NIH grants and such. Um, even though neurosurgery department, our neurosurgery residencies are pretty academic these, these days and have a year of built-in research. Um, but, uh, and, and granted that both of them had R01s already, so, you know, they didn't need the PhD apparently, but, uh, but they, they, they recommended it. And on top of that, I think the financial aspect was great too, because, um, you know, one of the worst things about med school is, is the cost, of course. And so having that scholarship um, is amazing. Um, and then now looking back at that, you know, my, my director of the MD-PhD program at UVA, he said, um, he, he put it this way, he said, you know, MD-PhD um, is not necessary for everything, uh, for every, any career in medicine uh, or medically related, but it's the best preparation to do literally anything in medicine from, you know, obviously being a doctor, being a scientist, working at NIH, FDA, being a venture capitalist, um, entrepreneur, what have you. Um, going to nonprofit, um, and on top of that, it does give you the freedom to literally do that because you have no debt, um, no yeah. at least no med school debt. Because if you went into four years med school, came out with three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in debt, or wherever that level is these days, like you have to pay that back. So you have to become a doctor. <laughs> you you can't you can't yeah. you can't pivot, um, and then you get sort of trapped in that life in that lifestyle. You became you become yeah you, you basically it becomes your jail, um, and so that literally allows you to that's that that allowed me to do what I did, which is you know drop out of clinical medicine um, without um, the med school debt, which was really key. Yeah, I mean I think there's definitely something to be said about not having a massive amount of debt after you graduate, uh, because yeah like you said you have to pay that back so it's almost like you're forced to go into that career and maybe you know maybe you want to pivot like you said into something else and in your case you were able to pivot into entrepreneurialism and you may not even have that opportunity if you had all that medical school debt if you didn't go that the dual degree route and actually get it paid for so that's yeah that's super exactly. interesting yeah no because because uh, you're on the hook right you can't if you're not in school then you can't defer your loans Meanwhile, you're, if you're doing, deferring your loans, you're racking up a ton of uh, um, interest. But, um, but yeah, but that's for, for that sort of bill, it's, it's several thousand dollars a month. Like, how are you going to be an entrepreneur if you owe seven, several thousand dollars a month? Yeah, because with entrepreneurialism, you can, as you probably know, you, you're, not, you're not really making anything in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> depending, I mean, on the, depend, yeah depending on the project. But usually, even if you yeah. have like large sums of venture capital, uh, you're not paying yourself if you're if your company's not profitable. You gotta you know usually yeah, your founder's and, not. So. And probably and probably it took you months or maybe even a year or two to get venture capital. So yeah, so you weren't getting salary for two years before that. So which is true in my case. Yeah, that so that's super interesting. Okay, so um, so you graduate with your MD PhD, then you go into residency, and then at some point you're like, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I want to I want to pivot. I want to do something else. I don't want to go into, or I don't want to practice surgery. So I'm just curious, like, how, how did that come about? So now we're on, we're on the topic of entrepreneurialism. How did you decide that, okay, you know, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon one day, and I'm in residency for neurosurgery after, you know, spending all this time in school, which is a very long time, as you know. And then you're like, wanting well, to jump in. This. <laughs> yeah, as you know, as you know. <laughs> so how, how, how did that come about? I'm just curious as to where you got this, inspiration to become an entrepreneur i'm assuming that your 
you know, given your background prior to becoming an entrepreneur, you sound like a very driven individual and you want to you know, positively impact the lives of people. But how did you decide that, you know, entrepreneurialism was the way that you wanted to do this? Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, I think this is, uh, I think it's good to sort of step back and, and um, sort of e even the way that, um, you know, that we're, we're discussing these things, like, you know, I, I want to be a neurosurgeon, a doctor, a neurosurgeon, an entrepreneur. And, and these are, these are just like identities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times we fall in love with um, the thought of these identities and then we get there and it's not like we thought because obviously not everything is, is peachy um, and some things are hard. Um, and, then, and, then, and then we, but we, but we've already told everyone that we're gonna do this. And so we don't want the shame, the guilt, whatever, the judgment. Um, and so, um, Luckily, I didn't really have that problem. Uh, so, um, but I think that's a, a big problem of what happens, you know, today, even with just the pre-med, you know, like I said, most of my friends were pre-med and, and they ended up not doing that um, because they didn't find their passion like I did in, in medicine. Um, and so I guess I think I'm, I'm lucky, um, and this goes back now to, I don't, I don't know why my primary education, you know, my K through 12 was so, um, uh, such a huge, had a, such a huge impact on me, but it did. I mean, the, Mrs. Hoagie's ecology experiment. Um, and then I think the 11th grade philosophy course, I think, um, and I don't even know why I signed up for it. I think just because my friends were in it because I had no interest in that. But, um, but that like really changed my whole perspective on things, you know, just, look, just uh, reading about like Buddhism, Zen, sort of uh, the Suzuki beginner's mind versus expert mind. That one, that was a game changer, you know. Plato's allegory of the cave, uh, another game changer for me, just internally, it just completely, again, just changed the way I looked at the world. Um, and, um, and so um, I lost my train of thought, but um, basically, I think because of that grounding in, in that just sort of self-awareness, I think, um, I came in, you know, after the research experience, I came in more with a vision rather than an identity goal. So I had a vision goal rather than an identity, identity goal. Um, and my vision was to advance medicine, specifically um, neuro, neuro, neuroscience, um, clinical medicine, um, and more specifically brain cancer. By the, by the time I finished the work um, in Dr. Grady's lab, uh, I was really influenced by the, um, the grand rounds and, and this cancer glioblastoma, which basically kills um, most people within a year. Um, and so, uh, so that was my vision, cure glioblastoma, <laughs> which is now my nonprofit. But, um, so that was, you know, 25 years in the making. Um, but, uh, but so, so it didn't matter what I was physically or doing career wise, that would always be my North star. Um, and, and that, that I had that set in my head. So when I realized neurosurgery, you know, surgery is never going to cure brain cancer. You can't cut out the entire brain because by the time you diagnose these patients, cancers intercalated normal brain so much that you literally would have to remove the entire brain to get all of it out. So there's no surgical cure. Um, and so I, I, so I, I made that realization um, and, and decided that, you know, although that experience would be valuable um, for the research, it was not necessary. And so that's why I, I was okay with um, sort of pivoting away from neurosurgery. Um, and then and actually one thing happened before neurosurgery residency and that was I studied at Oxford for three years. Um, I did a postdoc right after med school um, because I was just so hyped up on my research um, and wanted to get into gl more glioblastoma brain cancer research. But anyways, um, but so that actually leads into why I left neurosurgery is because I discovered something at Oxford um, that was really foundational, uh, you know, fundamental mechanism of cancer, uh, brain cancers. And, um, and so I went into neurosurgery residency with that sort of burning a hole in my brain. I'm like, hmm. do I really want to spend seven years um, or even eight years, you know, training to become a, a surgeon. Um, I love patients, but, you know, literally just training to become a surgeon to cut things out when I could spend that time instead developing this idea that I, I now have thanks to Oxford. Um, and so that was, that was a math I had to do. And, and so like, like you said, you know, to do all that work and then um, and then sort of change. I didn't see it as a loss because all that stuff led me to that and was necessary for that. So I, so it was, none of it was wasted. It literally could have happened unless I did it that way. I truly believe. Um, and so, 
I sort of gave myself permission to um, say, okay, neurosurgery is probably not the best route for me having the most impact on these patients. What is? I made this discovery. Let's make a drug. Um, and so, you know, they tried to keep me, the, you know, great people, uh, Keith Black, you know, great uh, neurosurgeon. Um, he's still the chair and he studied glioblastoma for um, uh, several decades as well. And he tried to, he offered me my own lab as, a, as an intern resident. Um, and I'd be an honorary PI. I'd be basically a faculty member and an intern. He promised me a startup fu uh, fund uh, to start the lab. You know, like a, I asked for a quarter million dollars. He didn't bat an eye. Um, so I could have done it in academia. But um, part of me wanted to, so I was under the um, impression that you know, entrepreneurial, uh, on, if I did this in industry, it might be faster because I wouldn't have to deal with all the politics and um, oh. sort of the academic metrics that are required yeah, to, yeah. to, to forward politics, something yeah. like this. Yeah, you know, you know the, the grants and, and the publications yeah. and all that stuff. Wouldn't have to check off all those boxes. I could just get down to business and create this, this drug. And so yeah. hardest decision in my life, but um, one of the hardest, uh, okay, now it's probably the hardest, uh, but uh, uh, we can talk about that later. But um, but yeah, so I decided to, to take the leap. And so I quit. I tried um, starting a company in my Beverly Hills studio um, for six months. Couldn't get any traction. Reached out to everyone I knew, which wasn't a lot of people. Um, but in the meantime, I was writing, trying to write patents by myself. And so I, I actually did write the first patent um, myself just by self-learning. Bought a book on Amazon um, and, and used the web. But um, then I decided, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I got to go all in. So I moved to San Francisco, you know, birthplace of biotechnology, yeah. moved up there and, and uh, luckily got a position at UCSF um, doing literally exactly the research I needed to do to, to launch this company. So it, it was just uh, sort of a lot of luck involved in that. Um, and I didn't tell the, my PI that I wanted to spin out a company at the beginning. Eventually I did, obviously. But, uh, but uh, when the data started coming in good, um, we spun it out and so so yeah so it's just an evolution of the same vision right so you know i thought it was going to be you know in medicine being a neurosurgeon being an academic neurosurgeon um and then you know and then i decided you know maybe i should just make the drug myself but it was all with the singular goal of you you have it out for this particular type of cancer known as glioblastoma like that is that yep. is that 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 is your enemy in life at the moment. Like that is what you want to take exactly. down. And exactly. where, where did that come from though? Like why, why glioblastoma? I mean, I know that that's a particularly deadly and aggressive form of brain cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, throughout your training, you probably encountered all various forms of cancers. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm guessing that maybe perhaps you wanted to go after this one because it's particularly obstinate, very, very difficult to deal with. Um, and from a surgery standpoint, as you said earlier, it's not something that you can really tackle from a surgery standpoint. Exactly. No, exactly. It, uh, it really, it, again, so I guess having that early exposure, you know, so let's take a step back for glioblastoma awareness. You know, glioblastoma is the most common, the most malignant primary brain tumor in adults. And when I say primary, I mean, it's arising from the brain itself. Um, you know, okay. there's metastases to the brain, you know, from lung cancer and breast cancer. And metastases actually outnumber glioblastomas by 10x. So that's actually the most common brain tumor. Okay. Um, but the most common intrinsic primary brain tumor is glioblastoma. Um, and and it's, it's much more difficult than, than metastases as well, but, uh, w which are also bad. But so, yeah, I just, I just got fascinated by not only the biology, but the fact that it was so intractable. And again, thinking back to where this all started in, in um, Dr. Wynn's grand rounds at the University of Washington, you know, I was seeing patients on the screen, they're going through the cases. In 1999, at that point, there were zero approved drugs for glioblastoma. So, you know, fast forward 20 years later, there are five, which is progress. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot, lot to be desired, obviously, because the, the overall survival hasn't really changed much. It's inched up a little bit. Um, and that's probably more because of imaging, like MRI has gotten a lot better. Um, so we can detect things uh, earlier and, 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 okay. and be a little more aggressive in that respect. Um, but from a um, biological, from a biopharmaceutical standpoint, um, 
the drugs don't really do much. Uh, the first approved drug um, has to be combined with radiation, and and it uh, it only gives you a couple months. Uh, well, I think it was four months overall survival benefit, but you know they didn't study quality or anything like that, quality of life. So, so yeah, and that was in 2005. Uh, <laughs> that was the first and only drug in glioblastoma that has actually extended survival. So wow. huge unmet need. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's up there with pancreatic cancer. So still, yeah, still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, so, I mean, okay, when you talk about drugs, I mean, is your, the drug that, I mean, have you developed it or are you currently in development? Um, the one that you're looking at, I'm assuming that it's, you know, it's patent protected. And, you know, is it something that works in conjunction with the chemotherapy and radiation? Is it taken alone? Uh, you know, there's something, I mean, I, I know very little about this, but I've, I've heard you know, in the past five years, something known as immunotherapy. Is it in that, is it in that realm? I'm just very mm -hmm. curious if we could go into dig a little bit deeper into exactly, you know, what it is that you, you have found. I'm super sure. curious. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's not, Immunotherapy per se, it's, it's considered a passive immunotherapy because it is an antibody. Um, uh, but but you know, antibodies made in a in a in a big culture. Um, that so um, so uh, the, the target of the of the drug is um, is an integrin. Um, it's called CD twenty nine or beta one integrin. Most it's it's a very fundamental molecule for cell biology. Um, and you know what people have shown is. Um, and so integrins are adhesion receptors. Um, and so, you know, it's literally not just glue that holds cells together, but mm -hmm. it's, it's signaling, um, it's, it's a signaling molecule as well. So it's, it's, it's one of the major routes for cells to communicate to each other. Um, and in, in malignancy, and there was a paper in cell like in 2004 um, in a genetic model of breast cancer um, that showed that, you know, that, um, that beta-1 integrin CD29 was required for the initial uh, carcinogenic event um, to advance uh, into a, an invasive carcinoma. Um, and so it's really fundamental for the, the initiation of cancer, but it's also involved in the progression of cancer. So it's upregulated in angiogenesis, you know, new, vas new vessel formation, so you can feed a growing tumor. It's involved in mitosis, so proliferation of a tumor, which is sort of the definition of a tumor. It's also involved in invasion, obviously, because cells are crawling over each other, that's adhesion. Um, you, usually. Um, and so it's literally involved, um, and so I'm not sure, sure if you're familiar with the hallmarks of cancer, but um, it's, a, again, it's a review that was published in, in Cell um, by some prominent oncologists, but basically it's the concept that, you know, cancer is driven by eight to ten different cellular functions, um, and the reason why we can't cure cancer is because most drugs are only targeted against one of those functions, okay. angiogenesis, invasion, proliferation, and if you only target one of those things, the other nine will compensate, and the tumor will learn and become more aggressive, um, and you're, you're basically selecting for the worst clones in, in that tumor, sort of a molecular evolution. Um, and so, um, so what's really cool about the molecule that, that, that um, OS-296 targets is it's involved in um, literally every single one of those hallmarks. Um, it's upregulated um, in cancer, um, and it's really fundamental, um, yeah, just for, just for the cancer progression. It's also involved in, in drug resistance. And so um, in radiation, um, the molecule is upregulated afterwards. Um, in chemotherapy, various chemotherapies, it doesn't matter which class. So it seems to be a general mechanism by which cells um, try to protect themselves. And in particular, cancer cells, they hijack it, of course, because they make many more copies of it. Um, and so I saw that as a huge opportunity. The problem is, of course, you know, this is a very fundamental cell um, uh, a component of the cell membrane. And so the assumption, the dogma was that you couldn't target this because you would basically kill people. Um, it's so fundamental that people, you know, it's an adhesion molecule. If you block it, are people just going to melt and disintegrate? All right. What's going to happen? Fair question. Be like, Fair question. Yeah. <laughs> is it going to be like Ebola? Um, and so, and so that was, that was, that's what I had, you know, that's, that was the issue was with the scientists that knew or with the investors that knew anything about science is, you know, are people, isn't this going to be toxic? And so, so that's, so when I started the company, you know, I, the first thing I want to do is toxicology. And so, you know, we obviously have to, um, you know, discover the leads and, and design it and, and all that stuff. 
um, and get the manufacturing process going. And then we did, so the first thing we did was a pilot toxicology study. Um, and the tough thing about our antibody is it only reacts to primate human um, CD29, beta-1 integrin. And so we can't use rodent models. So, you know, primates are very expensive. And so, so we did a, a couple monkeys um, and um, they were fine. They're literally, we gave it both locally in the brain and systemically through IV mm-hmm. and um, into intraperitoneal intra, uh, cavity. And uh, there were um, up to even 100 mg per kg, which is, you know, probably 10x a, a normal dose. Um, we saw no one toward effects, um, which, which is amazing. Um, so were, so the, were these were these sick monkeys or healthy monkeys? So you were just they're, looking they're for toxic a lot, healthy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, you're just exploring the drug toxic, itself. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. So it sort of it sort of dunked, uh, the, that that whole theory, and um, um, but still people didn't believe it, and, and and they probably still don't, and that's why we need our phase one data now um, to get the safety data in humans. And uh, where are you in your phase one right now? Are you like towards the beginning, middle? Exactly. End? So. Um, it's at the very beginning. So, okay. so just, just to clarify, so that I, I developed the drug through Onkos Energy. Um, that was my first startup. I uh, started it, spun it at UCSF in 2011, technically 2013 is when we incorporated. But um, um, so I'm no longer with that company. Um, I left the company last uh, summer once we got the okay from the FDA to start phase one. Um, and that's when I decided to focus. So again, keeping my vision at the forefront, I decided to focus on cure glioblastoma um, yeah. to come up with, you know, a cure as fast as possible. Um, so I developed, I developed a tool, but we need to really build a cure from that tool um, in order to really cure these patients. Um, but uh, so just, just clarifying that. So the, but the, so the FDA did clear our phase one clinical trial. Um, they think in, I think in January, February, they're supposed to enroll their first patient. And uh, unfortunately, um, pandemic happened. Um, and this is really bad, you know, all oh, clinical man. trials got shut down. Yeah, that's so, very bad. Like potentially, potentially life-saving stuff, or at least things that could have had a difference, made a difference. Like that all shut down with the pandemic. Um, and, you know, all cases too, most, most operations and such. Um, and so, um, so I think they've opened it back up recently. Um, but now uh, I think they also lost some funding because of the pandemic. And so, um, I'm not sure exactly where that stands, but um, the company's still viable, obviously, and um, and um, I'm very bullish on that, uh, on, on the prospects. So hopefully they can get uh, the patients involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, of course, a very important drug to test, right, considering the implications of it. And it's, as yeah. you said, super What's the alternative? Unfor- <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's super unfortunate. Uh, the pandemic has just affected so many facets of, facets of life, and in particular with the clinical trials and, you know, as you said, life saving drugs potentially uh, not being able to go through their their proper testing protocols because of the fact that we're, you know, navigating a pandemic at the moment. So it's just one of the unfortunate side so, effects that's going to negatively impact society in the long run, um, yeah. along with many we, other. I mean, again, but what are you going to do? Just like everything, we just have to uh, yeah. we just have to grow and adapt, right? Which we're yeah. which we're doing. Um, in real time, it's kind of scary that things, have to, the way things are going, and you know, things are getting shut down again. So, so we're, but we're learning in real time. You know, we need, to, yeah. we need to adapt. We need to adapt because we can't just shut it down for good. No, absolutely, and um, hopefully that there's some, hopefully there's some sort of headway being made where you don't have to just shelve it, you know, until the end of the pandemic, where you can do something. You know, some progress can be made. Uh, so we'll see. Well, you'll, uh, you know, you'll obviously be more privy to that, to that information than I will, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens. That's for sure. So, okay. So you have, you, you, you decided at some point that you're just going to go for it and you moved out to the Silicon Valley area. So San Francisco, and I'm just like, did you have any sort of entrepreneurial like knowledge mentors, like unofficial mentors before you decided to kind of make the leap? I mean, was it terrifying for you to make that first kind of jump into entrepreneurialism? Uh, so, so yes, for sure. I mean, the big, the, the hardest, so the hardest thing already happened, right? I left something that I had been studying for 15 years to do, which is neurosurgery. That was the hardest thing. And so, you know, as I was sitting there in Beverly Hills paying for this expensive apartment, um, with no salary, um, for six months, you know, it shouldn't been, shouldn't have been six months. It should have, you know, 
because um, uh, I had already quit. And so, you know, it was like, what is the alternative? What am I, what do I have to lose? I've already done the hardest thing. So let's, let's freaking do it. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I just, I found, I, again, it was luck. I found that position, which made it more feasible. San Francisco was, you know, oddly more expensive than Beverly Hills. Um, and so, so yeah, so it just, a lot of, a lot of things just had to come together in the right way that luck, um, and, you know, obviously internal drive and I, I, I need to get this done, but, um, but I do, one of my, I guess my biggest, my biggest uh, weakness is, um, is that sort of executing, you know, I know what I need to do. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, I, I we know why, because we're fa- afraid, we, we fear failure and things like that. Um, and so I've sort of come to terms with that more over the years. Uh, it's still hard, but, uh, um, but uh, that was one of the first times I had to deal with it that intensely. But um, yeah, I just had to, I mean, what was, what was I going to do? <laughs> so I've already, I'd already quit. Um, they would have taken me back, but um, I had to get, I had to, I had to make good on my vision. Yeah. So um, you actually, okay, so uh, just to clarify here, so you actually found a position at the university uh, in San Francisco then? So you were, working in a lab, you were working in a lab there, and obviously you were getting money from that, and then you were able to actually advance what you were working on for uh, the glioblastoma project? Yes, so could... it's, it, it's, it's different now because, uh, you know, back, back then there were no, um, like, there were no, like, co-working laboratories, right? Nowadays we have J labs, we have bio labs, a lot of these commercial, a lot of universities now have incubators for their startups um, in biotech. So, you know, you can rent a lab bench for like a thousand, two thousand dollars a month. They didn't have that 10 years ago um, uh, when I started. So there was no way to do it. There was no way to get data unless I was at a university. And so with that, I obviously had to give them my patent. So UCSF actually owns that first patent now. I had to get, I had to license it back. Um, which was an entire another story in itself, but um, but yeah. So, but it allowed, but you know, in the end, it was worth it because it allowed me to do the work that was necessary to eventually spin the company out, you know, find my co-founder, attract investors, and get to where I'm at. Yeah, very interesting. So, did you uh, like who do, who did you listen to then, like to learn about entrepreneurialism? Like, did you, so you found a, a co-founder, was this individual kind of a mentor or did you kind of, I know that a lot of entrepreneurs go the route of just finding like in this, in this, I don't want to call it the self-help, but you know, like Gary V, you know, the Tony Robbins, um, Darren Hardy. I, I mean, I could go on. There's a bunch of various individuals mm-hmm. out there who, you know, you can buy their books, you can listen to their audio tapes thing, or audio tapes, <laughs> you know, di- di- digital you know, what era am I living in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can find, you can find audio, you can find video, you can read their books. Uh, I, I'm just curious, like, did you go that route at all? Or was it, you know, was your co-founder a bit of a mentor to help you navigate the business, the entrepreneurial realm? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, right. You can't, it's, it's very hard to do things alone. Um, and, and being an entrepreneur is very lonely. Um, but let me just make things clear. I love Gary Vee, but I, I, uh, <laughs> I discovered him late. Um, <laughs> And to be, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of rah-rah, there's a lot of, um, you know, motivational speaker type stuff, but you know, what he does is like really different. It's, it's, it's really, it's not, it's not about business. It's not about entrepreneurship. It's self-awareness and the fundamentals, you know, self-awareness, patience, kindness, empathy, um, and, um, you know, perspective, mindset. Um, and that's, I think that's the most important thing to, to, it, to, to really focus on. Um, and, and it's so great that these days, you know, he's all over the place and social media and everything. Um, back then, it wasn't as prominent. I think he had a book back then, but I didn't even know about it. So literally, I just started by doing. But I, again, luckily, like with two weeks uh, left um, before the opportunity would have been gone away, I saw a sign in the Genentech Hall cafeteria, which is a building at UCSF, um, for their um, idea to IPO course. So it was basically like... Uh, it was like an early Y Combinator like thing for 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 um, UCSF students, um, uh, not as prestigious, and they don't fund you. But um, it was sort of, it was sort of you know it was an incubator accelerator for for students who had ideas. And so I saw that, took a mobile, uh, took a picture with my iPhone, and I still have that picture and look at it longingly. Um, <laughs> uh, signed up, got in, um, and that that really that really changed the game for me. Now now they're all over the place. 
Um, but that was that that was pretty rare, um, and UCSF um, should be applauded for for that those early efforts um, because that because I learned how you know I came in with an idea and only eight teams were possible, but like 130 people showed up, right? So we all had to give a 30 second um, elevator pitch in front of everyone, um, and I totally tanked mine. I was so yeah. nervous. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not a natural um, public speaker, and I get really nervous. And so um, I was fine up right up until the moment, and then mine went blank. <laughs> but luckily, oh, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Luckily, I've been there. It, luck, yeah. And so luckily, um, you know, I was able to get out the fact that I'm MD PhD and I quit neurosurgery and I had this idea to cure brain cancer. Um, and that was good enough that I was selected as one of the eight teams. My idea was selected to be one of the eight teams that that we developed during the course, which is really lucky because you know then I got a team of. 10 people working with me. Um, and so, yeah, it was awesome. So, you know, I, I had to learn, you know, delegating stuff, which is a really hard thing because I'm a micro, micromanager and sort of uh, uh, used to be a real perfectionist. Uh, but so that, that was uh, really Ho useful. Ho hopefully you're better now because micromanagement yeah, exactly, can, till, yeah. can, can, just, can just kill the oh, vibe. For sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's something I constantly have to fight for, for sure because even, you know, in the startup it happened, the Onco Synergy it happened, even in my nonprofit now, um, because, you know, we're in the early stages, we're only in month nine. Um, um, I'm, I'm a little too protective of stuff at the moment, but and okay. so I need to, to chill out a little bit. So it's something I, I think, uh, it's something I have to fight constantly. Uh, but self-awareness self -awareness is, 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 the, is the first step. So, um, but yeah, so we were able to develop the idea through that course and it was amazing. And we ended up getting, there's a, like a demo day at, at the end of the three month course. I think it was a 10 week course. Um, and they brought, you know, VCs and angel investors and, and consultants and our team got number one. So, um, oh, wow. that okay. really, that, that was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah. Even though there's a lot of drama in the team and again, a lot of it, I, I will take the full blame for it Cause I was not a natural, I'm not a natural leader and I had to learn sort of the hard way, <clears throat> lost the team in the middle for a little bit. Cause that was, I was, I was just horrible. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we put it, we got it together and, and we got, we won, we won the, we won the course, and so that we use that to spin the spin the company out officially. Uh, incorporated three months later. That that's an awesome story. So you actually got into an into an accelerator or uh, an inc an incubator. What uh, mm -hmm. what's the terminology again? An, inc an incubator. Right? I think it's an, it's more of an ex accelerator. Yeah, accelerator. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the difference is, but <laughs> yeah. But it, well, anyway, you got into what? Yeah, you got into one of these uh, organizations. Um, at least you said like in, in, it, in its infancy where, you know, it is essentially engineered to help people with new ideas get going and to create, to create a startup from there. So, mm -hmm. so you got, you got accepted into that and you ended up, ended up winning. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming from there you, you got funding from VCs and angel investors. Nope. <laughs> no, 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 that wasn't a, I, that was, I would figure that was, just the like the, that was just, that was the just the beginning. That was just the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was, it was it was really, it was so, it was sobering for sure. <laughs> so yeah, I can imagine. So yeah, I mean, um, yeah, well, everyone's, you know, from, from the feed and we got the, the written feedback. I was like, Oh, this is awesome. Like, you know, uh, most of the comments were great and there's some constructive feedback, which is also great. Um, and what really broke my heart was, um, the, you know, one of the lead VCs, um, who was running the course, she, she was at a now defunct VC um, fund. Um, she came up to me after the thing and she said, God, I, w I wish you guys were in phase two because I can't fund anything below that. I'm like, we're like oh, 10 man. years away from phase two. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and so yeah. and that, that, was, that was like, in, in literally that is the VC model in biotech. It's, it's not necessarily phase two anymore. It's phase one, um, unless you are, a Nobel laureate or have that kind of swag, that kind of clout. Um, it's literally, if you don't have human data, no chance of funding. Um, and so, so yeah, by, I, I never raised from a bio VC, um, uh, like the, the bona fide VC funds, none of them. I pitched them all. I literally pitched them all. Some of them got close, um, uh, you know, had multiple meetings and things like that and go to diligence. Um, but, um, but, but unfortunately, you know, that's, a, that's a problem with VC. So, and, and Y Combinator wrote a great, um, I forgot the Y Combinator partner who wrote, um, the S the blog essay last August, but 
I just I just retweeted it uh, last week, um, I think, in, in Twitter. Um, but he was saying how biotech VC needs to be more like tech VC. Um, uh, so biotech VCs, uh, it's, basically, it's basically, like I said, you either have to be a huge name or already be in clinical or be a spin out from pharma. So, you know, so you basically have to have no risk <laughs> in order to get funding from a VC these days um, because there were returns. Um, uh, you know, I thought watching the social network and watching, you know, and some of these things where, you know, like the Facebook story with Zuckerberg, you know, um, you know, the lone wolf founder that drops out and, you know, they would, I thought that would be um, something that would um, engage them. And it did, it got, I think it got my foot in the door, but at the end of the day, I didn't fit their model. I was unfundable um, because I didn't have the connections. I didn't have the, the swag. I didn't have, you know, phase one data. Um, I was really far away from that. I needed several million dollars to even get that. Um, and so that's the unfortunate, unfortunate truth about, biotech VC these days. And so luckily, it's a little bit better. Um, and um, I think these biotech VC is going to have to go the way of tech VC, which is, you know, betting on the founder, um, yeah. rather than, you know, all this other stuff that de risk the deal. Um, and so I, it's starting to happen, you know, Y Combinator is doing a, a great job of, of taking bets on early founders in biotech with no experience um, with business. Um, and so, so, but it's still got a long way to go because yeah, biotech VC, all that money is literally going to these ridiculous $150 million series A thing. So like everyone just, you know, joins the bandwagon, you know, they, they see, you know, you know, one of these, um, luxury VCs put money towards this deal. So everyone just throws millions of dollars at it. And before you know it, it's a hundred, hundred, hundred fifty million. And yet they don't even have any data yet. It's just, you know, someone's very famous or whatever. Um, it's a technology spun out of MIT or something. And so, uh, so that's the unfortunate reality of, of the funding. So I got lucky because I met some angels. So really the, the okay. name of the game is finding rich guys. Uh, <laughs> finding, <laughs> finding angels. Finding rich people. <laughs> who, yeah, who, who, who will fund like a tech VC, who will okay. bet on the founder, on the people. Um, and also have, you know, some stake in, you know, obviously want to make the world a better place, have the impact, creating new medicines. And so those are the type of people that people should, should look for if they were at my stage, you know, just completely embryonic pre-seed biotech stage. Um, and so that's how I got through. Um, uh, I, I, again, was lucky, met some angels um, who knew some other angels, and they gave me $15 million dollars. Um, until I got my first um, VC deal, um, and so so yeah, I raised I raised twenty million dollars in the end, and only two was from VC. Wow! And then real quick for uh, for the audience who is unfamiliar, the difference between an angel investor versus a venture capitalist. If we could just sure, go through yeah. those definitions real fast. Yeah, so, so yeah, VC is basically VC is like a fund, right? Yeah, VCs go out and raise money from other people. And then they raise a fund, um, and then they reinvest that money into into startups. Angels, it's like Shark Tank. Um, angel investors invest their own money. Uh, sometimes there's angel groups, and then they pull their money, so it's like a micro VC. Um, yeah. uh, but that, that's essentially the difference. Yeah. So that's that's really interesting. How with in the biotech arena, the venture capitalist groups are are far more stringent than they are. And with tech, like they need more evidence with the biotechs before they'll actually invest in you. Whereas with the angel, I suppose if you're an angel though, you're, it's your money, you can do whatever you want with it, right? So if you, <laughs> so how did you, how did you actually go about finding your angel investors then? So did you find them through your venture, cap, venture capitalists or just through the networks in general? I suppose, you know, all of this goes to speaking how important it is to develop a professional network. Uh, mm -hmm. and regardless of Absolutely. what aspect of life you find yourself in. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, just having a good network so that way, I'm assuming that you met these individuals, perhaps some of them, maybe not all of them, but through through, through the networks that you had developed while you were, um, you know, maybe get going through the uh, accelerator or when you were trying to find venture, venture capital funding. I'm just curious yeah, how sure. you it's, found your angels. Exactly. So it's, it's really a quality versus quantity thing, right? Because like at the beginning, I went to all the networking events um, you know, and, and, you know, some of them did lead to VC meetings, but, um, none of them led to funding. 
So yeah. um, again, it's the quality. So it the money came uh, again. This is complete luck, serendipity. My co-founder um, is now she's now she's now the chair of uh, radiation oncology. He's at, at the time she was a professor and not not an administrator, but um, uh, and she was one of the world's experts in the molecule that we studied. She studied it, you know, CD twenty nine and breast cancer. Um, and so, I, so I made herself, I made myself known to her, and I said, "Hey, I've got this data. I know your data. Let's start a company." And she was like, "Yeah, I've been wanting to start a company, but you know, I'm a professor, and UCSF specifically doesn't allow professors to be um, an executive in any private company, so she couldn't do it herself. And then she didn't have the time either. She had a young family, um, and so, so I was that person. And so, it was actually one of her relatives." Um, is a multi multi millionaire <laughs> um, and basically did the did more of a tech VC funding you know believed in in my co-founder believed in me believed in what we were trying to do obviously we had to meet them times and in the end it did take like nine months mm-hmm. of you know hardcore grilling but but they funded our, our first uh, you know it, it was tranche but they, they funded our first 2.5 million dollar seed round um, so yeah, it was just sort of, it was right underneath my nose, but um, yeah, it was just luck. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. So would you say, would you, would you say then that that was kind of, you know, getting that first round of funding was really getting your foot in the door because you said you've raised like $20 million to date for this project. And, you know, I'm assuming that other people kind of were like, oh, well, this person's funding it. And from that funding, you were able to produce more data and then you're able to go you know, to another angel or to a venture capitalist and say, well, look at this, look what I have now. And not to mention that we have other people who have bet on us uh, because they believe in our product. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's kind of like getting your foot in the door a little bit? It's, or? It, so yeah, it's again, one of the things where you would think, yeah. and then you get disappointed uh, because it's not <laughs> like that at all. At, at, least, at least in my case, it was not okay. like that at okay. all. It, did, it didn't would, open the door. In fact, but it, you know, so obviously getting, making the progress opened up their wallets more, the same people that are funding us, you know, I started 2.5, ended up being, you know, like I said, eight figures in the end. Um, but, but no, I mean, you know, even before we raised that round, we raised the friends and family round. And I raised from, you know, the discoverer of CD29, who should, I believe, get a Nobel Prize. I don't know if he's in the running, but he should be. Um, mm-hmm. Very fundamental molecule. One of the leading scientists um, who trained my co-founder, who's also studying the molecule, raised from her, raised um, a lot of money from some really um, influential scientists and physicians. And um, even that didn't matter <laughs> in the end. But, uh, but I mean, I'm so grateful. Uh, and a lot of my own friends, in fact, um, some med school buddies, you know, by the time I was at that stage, they were already doctors making, you know, six figures. And so very grateful for them for, for again, betting on me. Yeah, they, they had no idea what I was developing, but they bet on me. And that was uh, so that was that was amazing. But yeah, but you can't uh, I mean, you, you, you watch things like a social network and you think it's supposed to happen some way. But in biotech, it's a lot more difficult because stakes are so much higher for these VCs. And the, if you don't fit their model, you just no matter what you have, it's just not they're going to say no. Well, they'll yeah. lead you on, but <laughs> just to keep just just in case. But <laughs> So I guess. OK, so perhaps the moral of the story is just just keep working at it then. And, you know, maybe, yeah, you know, you're easy, just going to have, you know, the money isn't guaranteed once you get your first adapt. round of funding, but just keep working at it and hopefully yeah, things yeah, come yeah. together. You can only do what you can do, you know, so don't, you know, don't dwell, right? Yeah. Don't beat yourself up. You know, that shit's in the past, like just move forward. Um, and, and yeah, and so I did have a problem with that. You know, I, you know, I have this healthy mindset now, but in, when I was in it, like my mindset, my mindset was all off and I was like, blaming all these VCs and, you know, yeah. um, I used to tweet very angrily about them and stuff like that, but, um, which I believe, but, <laughs> um, I think, but, uh, but yeah, but that, really that's my it. problem because yeah, it was, it's my responsibility to raise the money and we yeah. ended up doing it and, you know, we also got federal grants eventually once we had a body of work. And so, um, so yeah, so you just got to grind it out and, and adapt. That's the key for anything. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that's not just in, you know, when you're trying to raise money, um, for a biotech startup, but I suppose that can be translated to any aspect, any aspect of life, right? You are Absolutely. going to run into roadblocks and how you respond to it, how, you know, when you fall down or when you run it, when you run into obstacles uh, is really, really important. Uh, you know, Absolutely. Just, and that goes, that goes back to v, uh, to Gary V again, right? Yeah. It's the fundamentals. Like 
like, you know, he was the wine guy at first and then he pivoted into business. Um, and now he's pivoting into sort of self-awareness and all this stuff, but all the same principles are the same that he's used in all those um, past, past identities. Um, and same with, with my career, you know, uh, as a, you know, former um, neurosurgery resident to uh, former startup um, uh, CEO. And now I'm a, you know, a nonprofit uh, founder and president. So um, it's, it's really the fundamentals. Everyone, everyone tries to read these books. I don't want to name any names, but you know, they're looking for quick fixes. They're looking for hacks and things like that. And those will work in the short term for some things, but you really got to get your, sh your shit right. You got to get your crap right. Um, um, you know, at a fundamental level and it's, it's yeah. you know, it's, it's patience, it's self-awareness um, and empathy and, and kindness. Another thing too, like going back to like the self-help books, like the person development within, particularly within entrepreneurial space, I've read a number of myself and, for me, I think there's a lot of good material, but at the end of the day, uh, what I what I think is what you what you have to do the most, um, you know, minus the self awareness stuff, is you have to be willing to work hard. Absolutely, uh, you, you have, have to, you have to yeah, knowing you have is to only work half battle, really right? really hard. Yeah, yeah. Then knowing is half the battle. Yeah, you can know that stuff. You read the book and you know it, but if you don't do anything, if you don't execute, then then it's not. Yeah, you you have to. There's so many people that don't execute, execute or aren't yet that aren't willing to execute, and then aren't on top of that aren't willing to put in the work. I mean, yeah. the amount of effort or they're afraid, goes, right? They're yeah. afraid of failure. Yeah. They're afraid of judgment from their their significant significant other, their family, their friends on Facebook, and things like that, which is huge, actually. I think I think it's pervasive in in, in society now that social media and everyone's exposed. Um, and so, um, yeah, we we just need to get over it because failure is not a bad thing. If we if, if we learn and grow from it. Um, and I've had my uh, share of failures. So, uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think everyone has. And, you know, the key thing that you said right there is that failing shouldn't be something that, you know, d deters you. But what you do after you fail, like if you learn and grow from it, from it there's a great saying that I picked up in some aspect of my life is, um, you know, are you failing forward? Like, which means yep. are, you know, are you, are you growing from all of your experiences, where, you know, the mistakes that you make, uh, the failures, et cetera? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I failed at my first MCAT. I, I literally didn't study. <laughs> I took a couple <laughs> practice tests and I was like, you know what? I know so many people. I was really cocky back then. It was like, you know what? I know, I know a lot of people. I, I know my stuff. So I just walked in and took it and got like slightly less than the national average, which is horrible. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, horrible to forgetting and your chances are basically nil. I got two interviews, but I didn't get in that year. And I, that was like, oh my God. So I was talking about failing forward. So just for the next year, I went ham on the study study books and uh, took a course. And for a month, that's all I did. And, you know, got a couple uh, SD, standard deviations higher than the next time. Um, and, and here we are. But, um, but yeah, for sure. Learn my yeah. lesson. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? Yeah, you got to put in, you got to put in the work. Uh, in so I'm, way. yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to, you know, when you when you made the transition from you know the sciences, well, you're still in the sciences, but more in, in the business realm. How did you take your scientific thinking? So all of your training, like the refinement of your like your critical thinking skills, and how did you apply that to business? Like mm -hmm. where do you where do you see the overlap there? Yeah, well, I think it it's again it comes comes down to fundamentals, and so I'll take it all the way back yeah. again to eleventh grade philosophy class. You know, it's the beginner's mind versus expert mind thing. Um, and um, allegory of the den. Um, so it, it goes back to that, and it's not just specific for business. I, I use the same principles in science that I did in business. You know, and I, my fallacy, the, the, where I got stuck was I thought, because I thought, you know, my ideas were good and sound, scientifically sound, in business, that would mean I'll get money, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's not true at all, like I, like I told you. You can have all the data in the world, but if you don't fit, if you don't fit their construct, their model, you're not getting any of their money. So, um, so, so it's, it's more complicated than that. And then, in, of course, in academia, you have politics, you have grantsmanship, you have publisher parish. And these are things that have almost nothing to do with advancing science um, in a real way. Uh, they're metrics uh, uh, for career advancement. And so, you know, again, that's why keeping my vision as a North Star was key. Am I... Am, and, you know, you have to sit down and say, am I doing the most important thing I can do for these patients with what I'm doing right now? So is, you know, publishing 10,000 papers and, and writing 10,000 grants, is that actually advancing the cause? Um, you know, and so that you have to you have to ask that question. And it's a hard question to ask. It goes into self-identity, self-awareness, 
and it's it's you know people can get violent <laughs> you know it's 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 hard it's hard to deal with that with that internally um and so but that was my north star and i, I and, and i kept it throughout the academic through the business and now to nonprofit. so basically whatever whatever to, whatever it would take to get you to where you want to be and this is kind of exactly. what we use to to push you through objective everything. data of course yeah. yeah scientific method yeah but but yeah but but the, i have i have a, a very I have I have a really hair I have a hair trigger on my BS alert and and so so yeah so I'm I'm able that's one of my superpowers I think is I when I read <laughs> new papers and stuff like I, I can just cut through the bullshit and and it's helped yeah. me because I I am also a journal reviewer I've been an ad hoc journal reviewer um, for um, neuroscience journals uh, one for almost 15 years now the, the main one um, and um, and it's been great um, of course you know it it, it it can be brutal at times you know for for the for the for the authors, but um, you know I'm always trying to give constructive feedback. But, uh, but yeah, I, I I laid out there objectively. You know this is not right. <laughs> Stop saying that. So I mean, so yeah, it's, I I have a my BS alert is is very um, it's very key. It's 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 very it's very sensitive. <laughs> well, I mean that well that's super important, right? Particularly when you're trying to run a team. Um, and well, whether or not you're in academia or any team in general, but when you're in the business realm and you have lots of money on the line. And, you know, you have to be able to take in all of the evidence that's presented to you. And I'm not just talking about when it comes to like your clinical trials, but how your team is meshing together, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, you know, business relationships say, okay, what is all the evidence available? Let's look at the facts. And then from there, make the best decisions that you can, that you can. Uh, because, you know, and then, and then the like, business side of that yeah. as well, because, because they have to make money. Right. Yeah. And so that was, that was one of the things why, that led to me leaving Onco Synergy was, um, you know, I didn't want to be a biotech CEO because the job of a biotech CEO is to make profits for the investors. Is that my North Star? No. So I was conflicted for a while. And so, you know, at the beginning stages when I'm still developing drug and it's still about, you know, the greater, you know, the macro of it all yeah. um it's one thing but then when you start actually have the drug and, you're, and people are saying well you can make more money or investors will fund you if you do this cancer instead and i say no i actually quit my entire career to focus on this cancer i'm not going to do it and you can't make me <laughs> um so it's that self-awareness you know that you have to keep that north star um i mean it, it's about it's, it, it comes down to happiness right too right i mean so so yeah and so the business the business side so you need to find that balance, you know, and, and, and I think bio, biopharma is not for me. So I'm trying to explore that now in, in, in nonprofit. Um, so I'm basically running a nonprofit biotech. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, so, so there's a lot of things uh, that are below the surface that you might not be familiar with. And, and just going back to the VC thing again, um, you know, well, okay. So going back to like a big pharma thing, I met with a pharma guy. Um, their business development team. He loved, he loved what we were doing, and was really excited at the meeting. And I was like, "So, so what do you think?" And he's like, "I really love what you what you guys are doing. I understand the science because he was a PhD." And he, but he goes, "What he said like destroyed my soul." This was in 2015. <laughs> um, he said, "This is so great, but my marketing team will kill me if I bring them a glioblastoma drug because they what, wouldn't yeah, know." What did he mean by that? Because they wouldn't know what to do with it because the market's so small. It's an orphan disease. Uh, There's only 15,000 patients diagnosed a year. Um, okay. you know, only, only a few multiples of that that, that are, that, uh, you know, the, that's the prevalence. And so the market is small, um, which, you know, nowadays you can make that up by charging more, um, which it has its own bad thing. But, uh, uh, yeah. but yeah, there's, they were literally worried about the market size. And so again, so that's, that's well, that, another that's, nuance. Of that's, thing capital, about. that's capitalism for you though, that's to capitalism. a degree, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, we, we operate in this very hyper, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I think it's fair to say this is a very hyper capitalistic society where it's, Absolutely. you know, kind of putting profits above everything else. And you are presenting a very, very important drug here, but they don't want to explore it because of the fact that they can't make enough money on it, even though yeah. it could you know, dramatically impact positively uh, people's lives even if it's a smaller percentage than they would like. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you have to make the decision for yourself because, because there yeah. is a, because if I wasn't so, if I wasn't so, um, I guess committed to glioblastoma, um, 
I could have easily gone for the lower hanging fruit. Um, and, and we had considered doing ovarian cancer and breast cancer, um, which had been more attractive from an investor standpoint, uh, less of a risk. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, and, and there, so the argument, argument could be made that, you know, if I did that, I might have gotten, you know, $50 million, developed the drug quicker, but you never, you never know, right? So, but I'm, I'm happy, um, but I also would have been miserable and I probably would have left right then. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and, but I'm happy because the VC that we actually did bring on board, it's not, not a typical VC, it was actually a state VC, a state fund, so it's evergreen. Um, um, and they usually don't lead deals, but they led this deal because of the conviction of the partner who believed in my team and our idea and was gung-ho about glioblastoma, literally the only VC we met that was really gung-ho about glioblastoma, and they took a bet on us. Um, and so that, again, was just a bunch of serendipity and luck, um, just volume meetings. But, um, but yeah, so uh, it's just, uh, so you never know what could have happened. But, uh, but anyways, again, don't dwell. We're, we're going to enroll patients this summer. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, congratulations, and that's, you know, Thank you. you know, kudos to you for all the, all the hard work. And I mean, I, I love what you were saying about, you know, your North star and doing what makes you happy. I mean, I think that's really, really important. And unfortunately due to, you know, life situations, or let's say like, for example, coming out of school with a lot of debt, people end up you know having to do things that they don't, they don't want to do, but they have to do it to pay their bills. Mm-hmm. And which is okay for a which is, which which yeah which is which is okay. Um, it's it's unfortunate that it happens to a lot of uh, people, particularly uh, these days. You know, going to school with how expensive it is, but oh, yeah. you know, still whatever doing whatever you can, I suppose, to just make sure that you know, the, you're trying to you know stay happy and mm-hmm. you know stay focused on whatever your particular life goal is, um, and do what you exactly. can uh, to get there. But yeah, I that's. That's exactly. very awesome. And again, again, I got to give credit to Gary V on that North Star thing. Yeah. So that's, that's what I was doing. That's what I was doing. I didn't, I didn't call it that. I, okay. I just called it my vision. But, but yeah, so, but I think that's a, an analogy that everyone can relate to. Is that, so I'm, I mean, I'm loosely familiar with uh, Gary V stuff. I've watched some of his things and listened to a few of his podcasts, but does he say, is, is the North Star his thing? Is that kind of what he's, what North he, Star is he, happiness. Okay. North Star is happiness. Okay. Period. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, and he just, he just, you know, he drills that down every day and all the content changes a little bit, but that's, that's literally all he's saying over and over through the different guests he has and stuff. And um, yeah, it's really, he, he literally changed my life in the past three years. It's, it's probably the reason why I was able to quit the biotech um, and, and do and risk and risk again and the next evolution in this nonprofit realm um, and sort of eat dirt again after having been, <laughs> Basically, basically being, you know, in the 1% for, for yeah. almost a decade and then going down to nothing um, uh, and not having a salary and things like that. So, so yeah, uh, but uh, I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, it, it definitely sounds like it. And I know that I uh, follow you on Instagram and I, a lot of your Instagram stories are Gary Vee quotes and like things from yeah, Gary Vee. So I can see you like you're a huge fan. I'm not paid. I'm just a huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. Is that- yeah. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Uh, anyway, Sean, uh, thank you so much for joining. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and to thank learn you. your journey, uh, through, not only through science, but then the entrepreneurial journey as well. So if anybody wants to find out more about you, find out more about the nonprofit um, that you're running currently, or perhaps the, you know, the company that you've co-founded uh, with the glioblastoma drug, you know, where exactly could they start? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, so um, I'm brain surgery dropout at brain surgery dropout on Instagram. <laughs> Um, and uh, TikTok, um, and I'm also on on um, Twitter, but it's brain surgery dropout it was too long, so it's brain surge dropout. But anyways, that's that's a good place to start. Also, brain surgery dropout dot com has all those links. Um, so okay, that's probably the best place to go. Plus, pay, plus thank you, Jonathan. Uh, best place to go. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, for those that are tuning in. Um, you know, all of those links will pre- uh, be provided in the show notes. So definitely make sure to check that out. And until next time, take care, everyone. Bye now.